Good afternoon and welcome to this heritage lecture from the Christian Medical College, Velo. Our Department of Continuing Medical Education welcomes Professor Maman Chandi, the director of the Tata Medical Center, Kolkata, and the founder of the Department of Hematology at Christian Medical College, Velo. Dr. Maman is a person of many firsts. So from the university gold medals for MD medicine and MBBS to the first successful bone marrow transplantation in India, the first DM hematology program. He has excelled in many fields, in education, in service, in research. I think most of all, Dr. Marman has a remarkable breadth of talents. He's able to integrate cutting edge research with sensitivity to cost effectiveness. He's able to integrate compassion with the dynamism to build lasting institutions. I remember in 2003 at the inaugural CME of palliative care, I had asked Dr. Marman to speak on how do we offer oncologic options in incurable disease? Today, our topic is a little broader and thank you for agreeing to us to speak today on high-tech treatments in low resource settings. How do we choose? Professor Maman Chandi. Uh, thank you very much, Reena, for inviting me to do this. I get a little apprehensive when I hear that it's a heritage lecture. So heritage carries with it a lot of connotation, but I'm happy today to just take you through some thoughts on how we practice medicine. Actually, it's a three-tier society in which we work and we have to be conscious of that. Uh, the first international meeting that I went to in my life was an invitation to speak at the International Society of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology in Hanover. And the topic given to me was treating leukemia in a three-tier society. And uh, I did give that talk and uh, one of the members of the audience was insistent that it should be published. May I interrupt for a minute, sir? We yes. are not getting your slides on share screen yeah, yet. Yeah, I haven't yet. I will put them up in a minute, right? Okay. Is that up? You can see my slide. Thank you. Okay. So uh, many years later, I was invited to give a talk in South Africa and by one of our CMC alumni, Rema. And uh, there was a professor in the audience from Belgium. She came to me after the meeting and said, Dr. Chandy, I still remember your talk in Hanover. And the reason I'm doing pediatric hemonc in Africa is because of what you said that afternoon. So I thought years later, I'm hearing that something I said made a difference in the way a person approached where she would work. So it was very gratifying. So today my brief is to tell you how how we for the patients who come to us. So. Uh, my first slide up here is a slide from a meeting in Goa. I normally never go for the API meeting, but this time I was invited to give a talk on all the advances in medicine, which I thought were important. And I gave a talk about all the high funda things that had come into medicine. This was in 2007. And 
Professor M.K. Mani from Apollo in Chennai followed me and he was giving the Rabindranath Tagore oration for the API that year. And this is what Dr. Mani had to say. He started off by saying, I have to atone for my sins. Said Dr. Chandi has told you the fantastic things that are happening in medicine. But I want to make a confession that I've come to atone for my sins. So what are his sins? So he said, I have recommended renal transplantation and other therapies for people with renal disorders, which have resulted in destroying families. Their daughter can no longer get married. Their children cannot go to school. They've sold their house and property. And I'm responsible for that. I was amazed. Here is a physician from Apollo who is saying that he has to atone for his sins. And these are his sins. So he said the atonement he's doing is to start a village program to tackle the two important causes of renal failure, hypertension and diabetes. So he's trained healthcare workers to treat hypertension and diabetes in the village. And that is a measure of his atonement for his sins. So I think all of us who practice in India have to be conscious that we are not responsible for destroying the economic stability of the families of the patients we treat. So this is a comparative just for you to look at. And you can see that the US, the GNP is about $63,000. Whereas India's GNP per capita is 6,600. Now that $6,600 looks like a lot of money. It's about four lakhs, but this is not distributed evenly. And you can see that the health expenditure per person, this is data from the world population data sheet, is $141, of which 60 is out of pocket. So the government spend on health is about $80 per person. And if you think of all of the things that the government needs to do for health, it's a pitiable amount compared to what the US spends per capita, which is around 9,000 US dollars. Now, if you look at income and need, right? 49% of our population above 15 years only is employed. 6.9% lives below the poverty line, defined as $2 per day. So if you're getting more than 150 rupees a day, then you're okay. Otherwise, you're below the poverty line. India's top 1% of the population holds 73% of the wealth, while 670 million citizens comprising the country's poorest half saw their wealth rise by 1%. Data from Oxford. Now, the Lancet has given a diet which would be a good mixture of protein, carbohydrate, fat, fruits, and vegetables, and it costs 34 rupees per person per day. This is not something that most people can afford. And sadly, you would have seen your papers that India now is 102 out of 117 countries with a serious issue of child wasting on the global hunger index. We are watching all these farmers sitting outside Delhi. We produce more grain than we need, yet we have so many people who are not fed. But resources are not the only reason why patients do not get optimal care. Their educational background sometimes prevents them from understanding and going for a treatment you recommend. The opinion of others in the family who say what needs to be done. 
social reasons, lack of family support in terms of somebody who can stay with the patient when they need care. There are so many others apart from resources which deny a patient having the care that he or she needs. On top of this, if you look at our own world and you look at India, I want to look at it from three prop profiles. And this idea of population profiles is what I actually shared in Hanover. This is Samir, he's 68 years, he's married. He's a farm laborer from a village in West Bengal. He has back pain for six months. His monthly income is 6,500 rupees. He has one son who is a school teacher and the other who works in a jute factory. And he has a problem, which I will come to a little later. And he represents 70% of India's population. This is the sort of house he would be. And this is a mental picture of the imaginary person I'm calling Samir. Profile two is Mr. Bhattacharya, also imaginary. He's 60 years, he's married, he has a small stationary business of his own. His wife is a homemaker. He has a son who's mentally challenged. And he was admitted with renal failure and a diagnosis of myeloma. His monthly income is 40,000 rupees. This represents 25% of India's population. And that's Mr. Bhattacharya. And that is a small middle-class flat which in Calcutta from which he would come to our hospital. Three is, profile three is Mr. Sengupta. He's 65 years. He's married, has a flourishing real, real estate business. His wife owns a jewelry shop. He has a son who is a software engineer in the US and a daughter who does fashion design in Europe. He also has myeloma. He represents 5% of India's population. His income is query, 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 but I think it would be more than 10 lakhs a month. That's the sort of house he would come from. There are many Indians with beautiful homes. And that is our patient, Mr. Sengupta. Imaginary, of course, right? Now, the model I have chosen to try and address this question of using high tech in a low resource country is multiple myeloma. This is the model on which I want to superimpose these three profiles and show you something about the decision-making process that all of us are involved each day as we practice. Now, myeloma is a not very common disease. In the US, the lifetime risk of getting myeloma is one in 132. That's 0.76% of the population. The American Cancer Society estimates are that there will be 32,000 new cases of myeloma, 17,000 in men and 14,000 in women. And about 12,000 deaths per year from myeloma. We don't really have good data from India, but this is from one of my colleagues in Ames, Dr. Lalit Kumar. And he, the data he has given is 1.2 to 1.8 per 100,000 population. So his estimate is that there will be 50,000 new cases of myeloma diagnosed each year in India. Now, myeloma is a disease of the plasma cell. So it starts off with a single rogue plasma cell, which you can see to the left of your, of your screen. And this rogue plasma cell then starts dividing. At this point, it is a small population of cells. And this small population of cells does not harbor significant mutations. At this point, the patient may have a small paraprotein. So he might come with being picked up with an abnormal protein in his blood and a very low level of paraprotein. And at that point, we would actually call it a paraprotein or a 
MGUS, so an M band of uncertain significance. Now, as these cells proliferate and their number increases, you then start getting symptoms related to the disease, which starts chewing up the bones, which produces an abnormal protein, which damages the kidney. And by this time, the patient is symptomatic and usually comes into hospital with a back pain. And you can get disease outside of the bone. It's extramillary disease. And you can see here that as the disease progresses, the number of bad mutations keeps increasing so that by the time he has florid disease, he may have a significant load of mutations which contribute to the malignancy. Now, if you look at it, in the early stage, when he just has a paraprotein, we call it a MGUS. Then it progresses to what we call smoldering multiple myeloma, and finally presents with multiple myeloma. And we say that there are four things which identify that means we call them CRAB, and the CRAB is hypercalcemia, renal failure, anemia, lytic bone lesions, and this is the hallmark of an established multiple myeloma. Now, this is a picture of plump looking plasma cells, and you can see binucleate forms, and this would be what the bone marrow would look like in a patient with multiple myeloma. Now, the hallmark of this disease is the production of an abnormal protein. And this, you can see on electrophoresis, is an abnormal M band. It's in the gamma region. And we can quantify this by densitometry of this electrophoretic strip. And that is a good way of tracking the disease. Now, the other thing that happens in myeloma is that you can get light chains. And fortunately, we now have a way of measuring the level of light chains in the blood. And this test is called a serum free light chain assay. Now you can see here that in this, how good the FLC, this is kappa, this is lambda. We have two types of light chains. And you can see how nicely myeloma is separated, whether it's a lambda light chain or a kappa light chain from the normal in between or the smoldering myeloma. So a free light chain assay by itself can be diagnostic if your ratio is more than 100. Now suppose a patient among the three that I told you about comes with back pain, you have a suspicion of multiple myeloma, what are the tests that you would do? You would do a full blood count. You do a urea, creatinine, uric acid, calcium, and phosphorus. You would do a serum protein electrophoresis. You might do a 24-hour urine protein and a beta-2 microglobulin. You would ask for quantitative immunoglobulins, a free light chain assay, and immunofixation. You would do a bone marrow for confirmation, and you would do cytogenetics and a test called fluorescence in situ hybridization, which identifies the molecular abnormality in patients with myeloma and can help to risk stratify. You would do some radiology and a CT, MR, and PET are tests that you can do. Now you can see I have color coded. <clears throat> the black is what I think is minimal. The blue is yes for one patients in profile two and three. And the red really is what I would do for only for patients in profile three. And why is that so? This gives you the cost of the tests in Tata Medical Center in Calcutta. A CBC at, we are following CMC's rates. So we have a C or a concessional rate and a P or a private rate for people who can afford. So you can see here that the cost of all of the tests, which I won't go through, just to point out that 
a free light chain assay is 3600 rupees in C rate, right? And you can see electrophoresis, not so expensive, 590. And you can quantify an M band quite nicely with just a serum protein electrophoresis. And you can see that uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization to pick up the molecular defect will cost 13,000 rupees for doing a fish test at diagnosis. Now, is it necessary for a doctor practicing in India to know this? The answer is yes. Whenever we order a test, we must be aware of the cost and we must be aware of how that test is going to help modify your therapeutic decision making. Now this is imaging in myeloma. There's an international myeloma working group and they recommend a PET CT or a low dose whole body CT or a scanning MRI. And that is what would be current best practice in the United States. So this is a plain radiograph. And you can see if you have florid myeloma, you have a moth-eaten skull, your pelvis is full of lytic lesions, your femur is likely to fracture soon, you have wedge compression of your vertebral bodies, right? So what would be the optimum? This is a fancy MRI screen, which we do at our center, and you can color impose. So this is a patient at diagnosis. And all the red or orange areas actually show where there is active myeloma. And you can see that his whole skeleton is virtually affected. And you can see here, after his six months of treatment, the green represents return to normality of his marrow, where the plasma cells have gone away. And when he relapsed, the disease again comes back. So it's a beautiful tool to try and look at. And it costs 5,000 rupees to get a test like this done. Now, if you look at the cost of imaging, a chest X-ray, X-ray of chest, spine, and pelvis, which I think is enough, is 960 rupees. An MRI screen would be 3,500 rupees. And a PET scan would be approximately 20,000 rupees. So would you ask a person in profile one to go for a PET scan, which costs 20,000 rupees. I think not, okay? So when a patient comes for follow-up, again, you must be selective in the tests that you use. The black is for all, would cost about 1,000 rupees, and the red is only for those who are in profile three. The green is 550 rupees for quantitative immunoglobulins, is not a big deal. So one could do it for profile two also. Now, given on this slide are some of the agents that we use to treat multiple myeloma. Thalidomide costs about 1,500 rupees per cycle. Now you notice I've given a range because in India, drug pricing is like a fish market, right? So the price ranges quite a bit from X to Y, and that depends on what deals are going around that day or whether the catch has been good. So you can see that lenalidomide pushes it up to 6,000 rupees if you got the best, which would be four times. And pomalidomide, about the same. Bodezumib would cost you approximately 2,000 rupees per week, right? And you need that for 24 weeks. Next is Kafilzumin. One dose is going to cost you 10,000 rupees. Melphalan costs nothing, but today we hardly use this drug. I do use it for patients who can't afford. Next is cyclophosphamide, Dex, Daratumumab. There is a fantastic monoclonal antibody called Daratumumab, 75,000 rupees per dose. So obviously only for patients in profile three. And you have zolindronic acid, which costs 300 rupees, but most 
of my hematologists in big cities would prefer a drug called denusomab. <coughs> well, one dose costs 30,000 rupees. And there are RCTs which show that solendronic acid is just as good as denusumab. It does not have the problem of osteonecrosis. So for a person in profile three, sure, you can use denusumab. Now these are the combinations and the prices, which I won't go into now. And today there is no end to the way science has progressed. Today we have new antibodies, an antibody against the D-cell maturation antigen, which is conjugated with a toxin called mafodontin. You have a bite antibody, which will make a T-cell kill the tumor cell, even for myeloma. You have stem cell transplantation, an autologous, not so bad, four to six lakhs, an allogeneic, 25 lakhs. And today there is a new treatment called CAR T-cell, and the cost of CAR T cell can be as much as a million dollars, which is seven crores. To, to just take you to some of these, this is an antibody called blenatumumab, not used for myeloma though, but we have another antibody called 701, which can be used. It's a bite antibody. So you can see that this is the leukemic B cell, this is the T cell. This is your bite antibody, which makes the T cell come and kill the tumor cell. So we have one now for myeloma, which is in phase one trials. And you have this therapy called CAR T cells. So what do you do? You collect the patient's T cells. You engineer them to kill myeloma cells by putting in a antibody against DCMA, which is tagged to an intracellular activation domain. You then re-inject these genetically engineered T cells into the patient and voila, they have gone and destroyed your plasma cells, right? This shows the antibody that we would use. This is against CD19. In myeloma, it would be against BCMA, right? Now this is a person with extensive disease who is after a CAR T cell. You can see the disease has gone away. This is data from the ASH meeting, December, 2020, where you can see that 97% of patients responded to treatment with 67. These are all heavily pretreated patients. 67% of patients with a stringent complete response 26 with 10% with a very good partial response. And interestingly, the progression-free survival at 12 months was 77%. This is absolutely amazing. For a disease which has failed all other therapy, to engineer the patient's own T cells, inject them back and be able to get this type of a response. Now we come back to our three profiles. And this is Samir. And you can see that he earns about 6,500. The minimum wage today in India is about 400 rupees per day. So if you get work for 25 days of the year at 400 rupees, you could earn about 10,000 if you got work. But most agricultural labor does not get regular work. He has lytic lesions in his spine. His bone marrow shows 60% plasma cells. He's got a creatinine, which is okay. His M band is 4.5 grams and his calcium is okay. Now, what would we give him as treatment? I would choose CTD. It's a combination of cyclophosphamide, thalidomide, and dex. And per cycle, that one month treatment would be 2,500 rupees. And if he didn't have money, we could easily find the money to give him this type of treatment. Now, if I could manage a bit more, I would go up to VTD, which is a proteasomal inhibitor called Velcade or Baresomid. And this 
will cost me about 10,000 rupees per month. And I have an alternative combination, which is VCD, which is 9,000. So not so bad. So suppose I give him, I somehow can get a drug company to donate the Velcade, and I give him the other drugs, which cost only 2,000 rupees a month. He takes his treatment. He comes back every month for a follow-up. He's from a village close by my hospital and he's doing well, his pain has gone away, everything's okay. The disease is in control and he's back to his farm and he's okay. Two years later, he's still on a maintenance of thalidomide and I could add a drug to strengthen his bone which would cost about 5,000 rupees per year. Relatively inexpensive treatment can be managed without too much trouble, right? And he would have two years of good quality life. A year after stopping treatment, that's three years down the line, he comes again with disease progression. He's got holes in most of his bones. His creatinine is starting to go up. He's in pain and he has difficulty. Now I could recommend a treatment which would cost 50,000 rupees a month, which would be a combination of a filzomib, POM or DEX, or I could recommend daratumumab, kafilzomib, POM and DEX, which would cost him about one and a half lakhs a month. That's wholly inappropriate. I don't have the resources to give that to him. He doesn't have the resources to procure that. So do you want him to sell his little one acre land and go for this sort of treatment, which would keep his disease for another six months? The answer is no, it would be inappropriate treatment. And the appropriate treatment, if you could scrounge some pomalidomide, would be to upgrade his thalidomide to pomalidomide and maybe go back to good old melphalan prednisolone, which was how we treated Mel uh, myeloma when I did my MD. That was all we had at that time. Melphalan and prednisolone costs virtually nothing. And I might buy a few more months of reasonable quality life with that treatment. <clears throat> Six months on melphalan and pred, he comes with bilateral pleural effusions which are sheets of plasma cells in his pleural fluid. And it would be wholly inappropriate to shift this patient to ICU, put him on BiPAP, intubate, ventilate, and continue the POMDEX. It would be appropriate to give him palliative care to see that he dies with dignity without pain. So that is an illustration of what one needs to do for a patient in profile one. As the disease has evolved now to a stage where simple treatment is no longer working. So the questions that will come to your mind and my mind is can the physician play God? Should we provide only the information which we think is appropriate based on the socioeconomic status? His son is a school teacher. He's very caring of his father. Do you want to tell him that yes, he can have CAR T cells if he goes to US, it's not yet available in India. And therefore, is it okay for you to withhold information or give every piece of information to the family and let them decide? I personally feel that it is better not to know than to know that there is a treatment, but you cannot have it because you can't afford it. So I would stop the counseling at saying, see, he's had three years of reasonable good life. I think now we should just control his pain, keep him pain free and comfortable. And you could take him home <clears throat> and we'll liaise with a local doctor who can help 
give him the morphine that he needs and keep him pain free. So can a physician actively dissuade a patient from choosing a treatment which he thinks will destroy the family's resources? I've had patients who are good Googlers, they know everything and they say, how can you say this? How can you say stop treatment? You can't do that. So where does the physician stand in deciding what to do and how to do? And these are the dilemmas we face as we practice, knowing that there are things that are available, but knowing that it's not available for all. I believe that the Indian doctor needs to know the cost and benefit of every diagnostic test that he performs. He needs to know the cost of the medication. He needs to know the cost of a treatment plan for the disease that he's treating. He needs to know what is the gold standard. How can you not know the gold standard? Because then for your patient in profile three, you wouldn't even know what to offer him. And he would have to tell you, doc, why don't I go for this? And the art of medicine in our country is to tailor this gold standard to what we know is best for the individual patient in front of us. That's not easy. It's not easy at all, right? But that's what I think we do. In India, we have two types of patients. We have the patient who says, Swami, Nidan Kadaval. They don't want to listen to anything. What do they know what a cell is? What do they know what myeloma is? What do they know what cancer is? I don't want to know all this. You just do what you think is right for my father. So we do have patients like that. We also have the patient who has looked up everything, who knows everything. When you walk into his private room, he's with his laptop. He looks up and says, Doc, what about car key in Israel? Right? So we really have to know everything if we are to advise the patient who is well informed. And it's tougher actually with option two than one. The second is the fact that we are not dealing with a sack of potatoes. We are dealing with a child with leukemia who has relapsed. But we think there is no option. And I still remember the father of a child whom I looked after in Valor. And no matter what I told him, he would say, Senjada, I have to do this. It is my karma. If I have to sell my house and my property, I have to do this. You can talk what you want, but I am going to continue treatment as long as possible. So we do have people like this. And always remember that when you're making these choices, you are making these choices, right? I had another patient whose wife had failed treatment for advanced lymphoma. And it's plea to me is, all I want is for my wife to be in my house like a doll. I don't want her to do anything. She just has to be alive. So when we are making these fantastic choices with our wisdom and knowledge, we need to remember that we are treating human beings where there are ties and attachments which transcend costs and resources. We need, we need to be sensitive about that. And that is what makes Medicine India difficult. So now we go to profile two, right? So he's reasonably well off. His monthly income is 40,000. And he's come in with approximately the same thing. He's got a creatinine which is elevated. So I admit him, I would start thal thalidomide because lalidomide is a difficult drug to give in renal failure. I then switched to lenalidomide. He has six months of treatment with podezumib and zolendronic acid. He's in good shape. His tumor is in complete remission. I would take him for an autologous stem cell transplant at about four lakhs for the autologous stem cell transplant. Is this a good treatment? Yes, he will get a reasonably good quality of life. I'd maintain him 
with lalidomide for two years, and I would add zolindronic acid once a month. On this, he goes back to work, he's well, he gets three years of good quality life, everything's going well, I finish the LEN, and then he comes back with a relapse. What is appropriate? Yes, I might give him local RT because he's got severe pain in his back. He has a lytic lesion. His motor weakness would improve with the lytic with RT, which is not that expensive. I would upgrade his treatment now to a combination of pomalidomide, cafilzomib, and dexamethasone. And this may cost approximately 10,000 rupees a week. So 40,000 rupees a month, I, he would have to dip into his savings a bit, but it would be okay. But a treatment of one lakh a month might be a bit too much. So Dara, Kafilzomib, Palmdex may be inappropriate. Eight months later, he's admitted with a urinary tract infection. His myeloma is not in control. He's in septic shock. Is it appropriate to shift him to the ICU, to intubate and put him on antibiotics, which may cost 20,000 rupees a day and totally destroy this middle-class family? I would feel that's inappropriate. So it would be supportive care with no shift to the ICU, no ventilation, and you're gonna take those decisions. Of course, discussing it with the family. I've had middle-class people who say, no, doc, I don't accept what you say, shift him to the ICU. It's tough, you know, when you don't have enough ICU beds, it's tough to wiggle out of that situation and yet do the right thing by the son who's desperate that his father should get what he thinks is care right to the end. And lastly is our 65-year-old gentleman who has all the money in the world right? He comes with, and he's got a bad translocation. He's got a 14-16 translocation on fish, so he can have what any patient with myeloma in the United States can have. So his initial treatment would be with Velcade. Now, the Indian Velcade costs 3,000 rupees. The American Velcade is 30,000 rupees. So I've had patients on this category that say, Doc, what is 30,000 rupees? No problem. Don't give me the Indian stuff. Just give me the stuff which is the best. So he would get Velcade from Janssen. He would get lenalidomide, sorry. And today he would have gone to Mayo Clinic and got an opinion. And they might say, hit him with the best Bofors guns you have. Put him on daratumumab, kafilzomib, len, and dex, quadruple therapy. And this will whack his disease way down. And that would give him the deepest possible remission, which could last <coughs> for a long time. His disease goes into remission. He has an autologous transplant. And he needs maintenance treatment because he's got a 14 16 translocation. He needs an imid. Now, the kafilzomib or the bodezomib means he has to come in for an injection every two weeks. Now, this is the data just to show you that with the four drugs, you can get the best possible stringent remission with four drugs rather than three drugs. And if you are so rich that you have no problem, then you can, instead of coming in for an injection every two weeks, you can have Ninlaro, which will cost you 65 lakhs for one year. It's an oral excessomid, which you can take. So easy and do that. Patient does well, he's back to playing golf. His real estate business is booming, no coronavirus around, and his, he does extremely well. But then, as for most myelomas, he came with disease progression. The family has all the resources. So what is appropriate? Send him to the US for CAR T cell 
at one million dollars, no problem at all. He may go into a good remission. And it would be totally inappropriate to talk to him about palliation when you have not used the best available treatments for managing this particular patient. So I've taken you through one disease in the past 45 minutes, and I've shown you how it is necessary for the doctor to know what is available, to know what is the latest treatment available, to know the cost, and then to choose for his patient and family with discussion what would be the most appropriate treatment. And I would end by quoting Sir Robert Hutchison from inability to let well alone, from too much zeal for the new and contempt for what is old, from putting knowledge before wisdom, science before art, and cleverness before common sense, from treating patients as cases, and from making the cure of the disease more grievous than the endurance of the same. Good Lord, deliver us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Coming from a person of your caliber and knowledge, there is so much for all of us to learn. Um, we have a couple of questions. Please put them in the chat box. Uh, if I might ask the first question. Now, in order to do the best in a particular context, we need as you said, to know both the science and the social context. So how does a doctor in a busy clinic find out the essentials he needs to know about the social background? And how do we, in this age of information overload, critically apprise science to understand the benefit in our context? Uh, Rina, I, for one, have never chosen the easy option, right? And I think the fact that we developed in Valor a bone marrow transplant program, which is like 1 40th the cost of a similar treatment in the US, suggests that before we throw up our hands and say, hey, everybody's poor, we can't do anything, it's hopeless, you know? We must strive our level best to bring to our country what is the best, right? I think it was one once when I was walking in the corridor, Dr. Jacob Chandi stopped me after he had retired, long after he had retired. I joined when he was principal. But many years later, he said, I want to talk to you. So I went to the director's office and he was sitting there. He said, what is all this hematology? I want you to start a division of blood diseases. You know, he thought big at that time, so many years later, and to spend time to tell me that I need to also think big. So I think what has been my experience is that if you strive, you can actually bring some of this superb technology for your own people and to treat your own population. So that's possible. And our, our development of a bone marrow transplant program and the way we've gone shows that yes, it is possible and it's possible to do it at a much lower cost. Now coming to your question about answering the question in an OPD, most often, it's not necessary in the OPD. In the OPD, the choices are fairly straightforward. It's either a new patient, or it's a follow-up, or a repeat. So in that busy OPD, you really can't grapple 
with all that I said now. Most often, it would be at the time of admission for initial evaluation that you make all these choices and where you have the time to sit with the family and talk to them. And therefore, I think that's when the choices are made. So in a CMC OPD, I think it is difficult. So you just have to do what's, what's immediately required and then leave the rest for later. Um, thank you, sir. A couple of screening questions that I sometimes used was, what is your profession? How old are your youngest children? And how are you raising money for this treatment? Um, and I remember what you, very early on, you always had, for the same disease, three sets of treatment regimens. Could you tell us more about that? Actually, this was long ago when we were treating acute leukemia, and that was published as a document about treating leukemia in a three-tier society. So you said profile three would be treated like any child anywhere in the US. Profile one would get very simple treatment, which has a chance of cure, but not anywhere near the 90% or 95% that children with ALL now can be cured. So when I actually suggested this in Hanover, many of my Indian colleagues were aghast. They said, how can you suggest something like this? But it is now 20 plus years and many things have changed. You know? So even the availability of, we are actually piloting an Indian childhood leukemia study with Professor Vaska Saha and with tailoring the treatment a bit, we are able to achieve not 95, but at least 70%, 70 plus percent cure rates for children with ALS. So we have to choose the balance because in India, an uh, event like sepsis, because of our problem of MDRO, pushes the costs up enormously. So I think it is possible to tailor even leukemia treatment. But for instance, an allogeneic bone marrow transplant, right? At 25 lakhs, if it's a haplotransplant, it's tough. You can put together resources. And now today there is crowdfunding. And crowdfunding sometimes brings in quite a lot of money. So I think the physician who chooses the easy way out, saying this is all that's possible, actually hasn't done justice to that patient. You really have to see how much you can do to help. Um, uh, Sandeep Pillai has pointed out and asked the question that uh, sometimes profile three and profile one are clear cut, but with profile two, how do we decide, how do we bear the benefits and burdens? Actually, I agree with that, you know. When I was in Valor, we had a person with hemophilia and the mother was dressed in a tatty tone sari, absolutely no jewelry. And I would have thought this person is from the village, right? So everything that we could write off, we wrote off, right? I came to Calcutta and I went to McDonald's. And here was this lady with the finest sari with jewelry. And it was the same person who was right. I was writing off bills in Velo. So middle class is tough. And that is the decision. I When I talk, I say, see, I don't know your resource. I can only say that these are the options. Do you want Velcade at 30,000 or 3,000 for the Indian brand, which I think is just as good. In fact, I would take the Indian made Bodesmib rather than go for Yansen. So that's the way I, I would talk to this middle-class person, because I really don't know what the resource base is. For the really rich, it's easy. For the middle class, you just leave the options open a bit. And most of them are very well informed middle class and uh, 
you don't lie to them. You tell them these are your choices and they make up the choices. And following on that, sir, uh, how do you ex explain about remission rates, the duration of remission so that they make an informed choice? Could you give us I an think, example? You know, uh, you know Ms. Varki, who was the superintendent of the Vinabisi campaign, and at her farewell address, right, I was there, and she said, Dr. Mahanan told me three years ago, uh, not three years ago, seven years ago, that I had three years to live. But here, it's seven years now, and I'm still alive. <laughs> so one needs to be careful when one communicates information. And she was an amazing lady, you know. She had kept something which was to be given to me after her death. It's a lamp which is still in my home. So uh, when we communicate information, we must be careful. Let's say this is the average. Yes, but people would like to know. There are, of course, for children, it doesn't matter. They only want to know when they can go back to school. They're not perplexed with the issues of life and death, right? They only want to know when they go back to school. But for their parents, it becomes important. And I have had older people who, in fact, want to know quite precisely because they have uh, agendas and things that they would like to do, and they would like to know what time they have. So it's a mixed bag in the way you come. Uh, we also had a question of what can be done in the national context or in our professional associations so that we are more sensitive about tailoring treatment appropriately? Uh, you know, I've generally found that the guidelines of so-called professional societies, right, they are actually only guidelines. And sometimes they make it tough for you to actually say what you think is right because some of the people who are on Google can get all that information and they are already well informed when they come to me. So I agree professional societies can help in terms of disseminating information and making it easier for a person to understand. <clears throat> The resources out there now are enormous compared to what it was. You know, I still remember the time when I was a junior lecturer in Ballard and I had a patient with a weird constellation of symptoms. So I told my resident, Mary, tonight it's in the library with Index Medicus. So those huge tomes and she sat the whole night and came up the next day and told me, this is this keratosis congenital. That was the first time I made a diagnosis of this keratosis congenital. Today, not required. Most of my residents are getting the information online and telling me in the OPD information that I want. So it's vastly And so that is why, in a way, if our Indian associations had these options, and some of them do, um, do you think it would make it easier both for the residents and for the patient who is Googling it? Actually, what I found was that for each disease, we had a patient information brochure. We never printed it out, but it could be printed out. Now I email it to the patient. So when a patient asks me about a haplotransplant for for AML, we have like four sets, our own data, what it is internationally, what are the risks, everything is written down and I just have to email that to them. And if they can read, it's not in the vernacular, so it's only in English, that helps them a lot because I've provided quite a lot of information. So if you look at Western countries for almost every disease, there is access to information from the website for that particular disease, patient support groups, 
family support groups, everything is available. Yes, so actually, yeah, tailoring the information from our own uh, experience and from our own resources and making such a patient information leaflet is a very good way to go with that. I note that Dr. Pramesh from Tata is online and he has been very conscious of this element, the wonderful paper, Choosing Wisely India. May I just ask Dr. Pramesh to tell us his thoughts on this? Um, could we unmute Dr. Pramesh, please? While they're doing that, I just want to acknowledge Professor George Cherian, my teacher, whom I can see sitting in front of me. He would ask you a question on rounds. And unlike most teachers, he would write it down in his little book to remember to ask you again whether you had to. It's interesting because Dr. Seshatri mentioned the same thing about Dr. George Cherian. And he said he followed the same policies to keep his postgraduate's reading. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Reena, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, we are, Dr. Pramesh. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, first, thank you for sharing this information and uh, allowing this to be uh, disseminated across the NCG. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed Dr. Chandi's talk as usual, very thought-provoking, and uh, uh, I, mean, I wasn't disappointed with the contents of the talk. So coming to what uh, he touched upon uh, very briefly. Uh, so while it's very easy for us to get swayed by uh, advances and the so-called uh, cutting edge technologies, both with diagnostics and therapeutic, what we very often forget as physicians and oncologists is the, uh, is the need to balance value into the equation, getting uh, whether it's cost uh, value for money before we suggest uh, in, Diagnostic or therapeutic. And I think he brought this across very well in the examples that he just mentioned, uh, both with, uh, though, though they were myeloma centers, uh, I guess that applies to practically every disease and every cancer. And I'm happy that he brought this on. So, uh, choosing wisely was uh, an attempt by the National Cancer Grid to achieve uh, precisely this to avoid uh, low value or wasteful. Uh, investigations or in an effort to make uh, our entire effort more uh, conscious of the value that we brought into the uh, entire treatment paradigm. And uh, that's one small effort that we took. And uh, the next effort that we've taken is the resource stratified guidelines for uh, cancers, uh, uh, common cancers, which the Aishman Bharat has adopted. And we are hoping that with these uh, uh, inter initiatives that uh, will actually be able to drive value into mainstream cancer care across the country. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank you and Dr. Chandi for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Pramesh. And uh, the resource stratified guidelines will be a huge help both to professionals and to patients. Um, so, what do you think is the government's role in addressing these constraints and these issues? As Pramesh said, I think uh, the making available whatever treatment is appropriate. See now, for instance, if you look at the West Bengal government, they sometimes make available very, very expensive drugs. But at the same time, you may find that in their pharmacy, some basic drugs which are available are required are not in continuous supply. So they also need to look at the stocking policy so that yes. George Sharin may be on uh, unmuted. He may want to talk something. Um. I note that uh, Dr. George Cherian has unmuted himself. So would you like to say something? We would love to hear from you. No, I was, when I saw this talk advertised, I was kind of asking myself what would be done under the circumstances mentioned. And uh, what I recall of my 
Velo days when we had really unlimited opportunity to write off whatever we wanted for the patient's concern. One had to be very careful about how this was done. Marmin was uh, talking about the cost and I thought his answers would be along these lines. But there was an earlier one where you have to think of if you have a family of 10 and a poor family and they bring their 10th child and if you write off all their bills or whatever, what are you really achieving in a much wider context? I would rather spend that kind of money in trying to save a breadwinner rather than down the line. Again, you're really acting God, but I personally feel it is necessary to act God. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, thank you. I, this is a heritage lecture, and I would like to just take this opportunity to ask Dr. George Cherian to tell us a little bit about when he was in CMC and who were his teachers. Actually, I am. You were listening earlier to Marvin, who was one of the brightest and best guys I have known. Actually, there were very few teachers in my time, because that was a different setting altogether. And as far as our postgraduate courses were concerned, when I was doing MD, I clearly remember that there was really no one to teach you. And literally before the examination, I would present cases to the wall. So teaching was at a the sort of teaching and training and coaching you get now is unbelievable. Those days you really worked for yourself. And sometimes you had seniors, you could ask questions. One of them, when I asked him a question once, told me that I have learned this with a great deal of effort. You better go and find out for yourself. <laughs> oh <dear. laughs> If I'm not mistaken, you were from the first batch of DM cardiology in Vellore, or was it uh, Tamil Nadu or India? No, this question of DM cardiology actually came up much later because I had joined cardiology much earlier. But historically, the DM first started in the Orinia Institute of Medical Sciences. I didn't really have to do my DM because uh, I was already into cardiology, but it was Dr. Chandi who advised me that when the course actually, I joined the cardiology department in 1959 and our first exam was in 67. So Dr. Chandi advised me it was better to have this thing in case any questions arise later. Thank you, sir. So we had a little historic aside to the 1950s. Uh, I missed a question from Dr. Rossi Abraham. Sir, do the new and expensive treatment modalities provide clinically meaningful benefits in terms of quality and quantity of life? Um, you know, Rina, I was thinking of Dr. Jocharyan's question, uh, uh, suggestion also. You wear a different hat when you're a healthcare administrator who's allocating resources, right? So if I was the health minister of a state in India, my allocation of resources would be totally different from if I was the father of a child with relapsed acute myeloid leukemia, right? Unfortunately, that's life. So as a healthcare minister, I would say that 90% of my budget will go for immunization, will go for sanitation, will go for family planning, will go for nutrition. And only 10% of my healthcare budget. Why is India in such a mess? If we are in such a mess because we're not doing that. Because it's politically correct to provide certain things and not important to provide the other things which actually would make 
a much bigger difference in human health. Dr. Jocharan said he would choose the breadwinner rather than the 10th child. But unfortunately, if it is my only child with AML, I don't care. Like that father who told me, Swami, it's my child. It's my only child. I'll sell my house. I'll do whatever I can to save his life. So that's what we forget. We wear a different hat when we are healthcare planners. Now in TMC in Calcutta, my allocation of resources for the poor are based heavily on curability of the disease. But does that mean I will give nothing for palliation and pain control? I have to. So we wear different hats in different situations. And we act, unfortunately, we are not robots. We are human beings. And even a doctor who makes these decisions is a human being. And you might say, oh, why did I spend so much on trying to save this child with relapsed AML? The chances are 10%. What a foolish thing you've done. You could have treated 200 CS cervixes with that money. I would like to just stress that we are human beings. Doctor also is a human being. He has emotions. And that's why when one of my team says, sir, I want to do this. I want to do this transfer. I have attached a relationship. Yeah, okay. Once in a while, we will allow your emotions to dictate the treatment you give, even though the chance may be 10 But when it's from the other side, when you're the parent or the husband or the father of a child with leukemia, it's a different equation and we must be conscious of that. And we cannot, if we were in a country where there is true equitable justice in terms of allocation of resources, then I don't know how much we would provide for rare diseases. It would be provide for hemophilia. Right? Current US cost for hemophilia per year is $400,000. So it's a tough question. And I think that we need not forget that we're human beings. We wear different hats when we allocate resources. And it's all right to do that. And uh, the other thing is that some very simple things which can significantly improve quality of life listening to the patient, understanding what they expect, what their priorities are, pain relief, symptom control. Those are not very costly. And they can come in from the very beginning of treatment. And it's a part of any doctor's repertoire of skills. So I think we are drawing close to our time. I wanted to ask you a final personal question how have you been able to sustain compassion through all these years of these difficult decisions? Uh, Rina, you know, I think the biggest joy of medicine is when you treat people as individuals, as human beings. Just uh, yesterday, uh, one of our doctors got a letter from a person whom he was treating for lung cancer patient died, but that letter from the daughter was amazing. He said, you gave my dad a year of life. He ticked off things on his bucket list which he wanted to do. He died without pain, with dignity, and for that I am ever grateful to you and the hospital. So I think that I feel that the sadness will be there if you care. But that's what makes medicine a joy. And that's what makes it... Uh, otherwise, I, as an engineer, you build a bridge. But here, yeah, you have individuals who remember you, who are grateful to you, whom you are... Uh, uh, you, you have, they become your friends. So I think if you're treating people as human beings, as individuals, 
then there is no escaping the sadness of the choices that you make, right? But I think that is also the joy of medicine, of knowing what is the best, knowing what is current, what is latest, and using your, trying your best to provide what is possible under a giving situation. That's what makes medicine challenging and also rewarding. On that very wise and beautiful note, we will close our last digital CME for 2020. Thank you, Dr. Chandi, and a very happy new year to all of you who tuned in. Thank you. Thank you, Rena. Thank you.